All right, we have a lot to cover in a short period of time. Uh, I'm a psychologist, I probably need a psychologist, but what I want to talk to you about is research, because I don't care what the latest fad is. I want to know things that are research-based. So there was a book called American Management and the Quick Fix. In the left-hand column, they had all kind of social fads, pet rocks, hula hoops, chia pets, God knows what else. In the right hand, they had all kind of leadership fads. Management by objectives, management by walking around, and your job was to match the year of the social fad with the year of the management fad. So that's why I want to try to center this in research. So I'm going to start with some research. And they looked at people who were in the top 10%, the people in the room, of leaders. And this is what they found out. You were more likely to be in the top percent if you had four or five skill sets well developed. So we're looking at leadership, negotiation, conflict resolution, presentation, communication, and decision making. And where those skills and competencies come together in a way that's absolutely seamless, and you can't tell where one starts and the other one ends. Now, we're going to focus on negotiation, but that's one of the skill sets. We're going to talk about becoming a strategic negotiator. We're going to talk about the master negotiator's preparation form, which is the heart and soul of this course. And we're going to do a case study together. All right. So negotiation defined. Negotiation is nothing more and nothing less than interactive decision making. So your name is Jason and you are? Cheryl. Cheryl. So they're negotiating and it's interactive decision making. But it's also intrapersonal decision making. Because all the time when you're thinking about negotiating with him, you're negotiating with yourself. So do I really want to use that dirty trick on him now or do I use it later? All right. So I know it's not true. But, it, but it's important to know that it's interactive decision-making. So I approach this from the point of view of decision-making. But it's also how well do you negotiate with yourself? All right. So one view of an organization is an organization is a complex network of agreements. And how successful you will be in your career depends on how well you negotiate with people outside your organization, inside your organization, and how well you create, influence, sustain, and alter parts of agreements. Which also means you have to understand and be aware of when agreements are no longer working. So you go to Safeway, you buy a gallon of milk. What does it have up at the top? Expiration date. So negotiations also have expiration dates. So we want to be aware of that, but also we want to be aware of how well you architect, and I'm using that on purpose, on how you purposely create agreements that are going to optimize the relationship rather than suboptimal agreements that leave gains on the table. I also would like to point out that after you architect an agreement, that's not enough. You have to get commitment so people will actually carry out that agreement. And as I stand here today, my daughter, who was supposed to be here to help pass out the handouts, and that's why I bought it in San Francisco, has my credit card, <laughs> and she's not here. <laughs> it's, not, it's not funny. <laughs> she, she grew up wanting to be Prime Minister of Canada, and tried to run the household as if she already were. <laughs> All right. There are two principal types of negotiation. How many? I'm sorry, are you guys alive? How many? Two. two. Okay, very good. The first type is a negotiation you can, in fact, prepare for. And we're going to talk about how you can come to your negotiation incredibly more prepared after the session than before the session. That's my promise. All right. So you're going to use the master negotiator's preparation form. You're going to use your yellow pages. I'll explain that later. 
And you may want to role play the negotiation if it's important enough. We'll get back to that. Atul Gwande, brightest light right now in medicine, wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto and how important checklists are. How many of you flew here today? Just raise your hands. Not today, but flew here? Okay. Oh, a lot of you. Okay. So uh, here in a plane, we have the pilot and the first officer. And they have a checklist before that plane takes off. What are some of the things they want to know? Weather. Does equipment working? Yes, that's very important. Yeah, having enough fuel, not like transit that had to glide in. Okay. So they have a checklist, and that's one of the things that makes flying so safe, correct? Now, this particular day, our first officer and our pilot, and they're the best pilots at Air Canada, sorry, and they didn't use their checklist. They've done it a hundred times before, a hundred thousand times before. They're the top guns. They're the best pilots at Air Canada. So they went to have a coffee at Starbucks. Now, would you want to get on the plane? The answer is no. All right. So just as they have a checklist, the master negotiator's preparation form is your checklist. And at the end, I'll tell you how you can get it and directions on how to use it for free. All right. One of the most interesting studies about checklists uh, happened in Michigan in the ICU, and sometimes the surgeons didn't go through the checklist. And the results were that people died unnecessarily. So they flipped the whole thing. So talking about yellow pages. Before the surgeon could start the operation, he or she had to get permission from Don, who was the nurse. If you know anything about medicine, surgeons think they're gods, and they, she has to get, they have to get permission from Don. What happened? The infection rate dropped by 66% and eventually to zero. I want to emphasize how important it is to have a checklist, and I'm going to show you one. All right. In the first 18 months, they saved $175 million and 1500 lives were saved. Is that impressive? Absolutely. Now here's what's the most interesting thing. They, are there any surgeons in the room? Okay. Uh, they, sur they surveyed the, the, the surgeons and they said, how do you like this? 80% said it's fine. 20% said, listen, I'm a surgeon. I'm a specialist. Don is only a friggin' nurse. They didn't want to use it. However, when they asked them if they wanted the checklist used, if they were being operated on, 93% said <laughs> yes. Okay, if the first type of negotiation is in fact a negotiation you can prepare for, what, pray tell, might the second be? You can't prepare for it. So they're spontaneous or impromptu. No matter how well you plan for the negotiation, it's not going to go the way you planned. So you have to improvise on the spot. And how well you do that depends on your intuition. And intuition is nothing more and nothing less than pattern analysis. So I'm going to talk about, well, how do you develop that kind of pattern and analysis so that you can negotiate more effectively? Just like the doctor who's done the thing a thousand times, all of a sudden, in this case, what's going on with Gilbert, the doctor just says, something's not right here. And so they change the procedure based on his intuition or her intuition. Because the pattern wasn't right. Didn't have to think about it. It just came that quickly. I'll show you that in a minute. And as a result, Gilbert, they saved your life. So we're going to talk about how do you develop and prepare for negotiation, but how can you hone your intuition so that you're better at negotiations that are spontaneous? And we just said that the answer is pattern analysis. We're going to show you that right now. I'm going to ask my friend Mark to come up here with his two buddies. Quickly, quickly, quickly.
All right. So there's a big fire in San Francisco in the Mission District. And the Mission is on fire, one of the most historic buildings in all of California. So Mark, the fire chief, is in, here in front. Okay, pick up your fire hose and start putting out the fire. Okay, you guys pick up your fire hoses, one on each side. Okay, come on, let's put some action in here. Okay, <laughs> that, very good, very good. Now all of a sudden, Mark says, stop, get the hell out. And you guys run for your lives. Stop, get the hell out. Run. Okay, rewind the tape, come on back. Now what was going on here? Well, first of all, Mark, your feet were getting very warm. It was an athlete's foot. You should hear the roaring of the flames, but it's very subdued. You've put on a 40 tons of water, and the fire's not going out. Skill testing question for the audience. Where's the fire? Underneath. Now, did Mark have time to think, okay, my feet are getting too warm, it's too loud, and the water should have put it out by now? No. He's so good at pattern analysis that he said, get out. And so you forced them no, to get out before oh. you. I ran out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and they survived, and we'll talk about the other later. Thank you very much. Okay, I promise you guys a book, so I'll give you a book afterwards. So that's a very good example of pattern analysis. So people who are master chess players know 50,000 different patterns. And they can play multiple games and win all the time. So how good, how well you negotiate depends on how well you do at pattern analysis and knowing when the exceptions are. So Valerie is terrific, and one of the things that makes her terrific is it looks like it should go this way. But her intuition is say, not in this case, not with Catherine. She's about to do a, a never mind. Okay. All right. So what are the assumptions that we make about this process that we call negotiation? All right, there are five approaches to negotiation. Number one, you can avoid, postpone, or delay. Is that ever a good option? Absolutely. I think I'm prepared. And your name is? Danielle. Danielle? Danielle, you know Danielle. She throws me a curveball. It throws off my entire plan. So I want to postpone what I'm doing. Even if I say, excuse me for five minutes, I just need to go use the phone. That'll give me time to think. Or I will call Catherine and Catherine will say, you know what? Try this. That's your yellow pages. Your ye no matter how good you are, your yellow pages are people that you can confer with that will make you be significantly better. All right. Take it or leave it. Is that ever appropriate? <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. Morally and ethically, there are some things that aren't negotiable, unless you're a dentist hunting lions. Hard bargaining. I want to get 90% of the value, and I'm okay with Emma. My preference isn't to be a hard bargainer. So why am I using a more assertive, a more hard bargaining approach with Emma? 
because she's a hard bargainer, and that's the only style she understands and respects. So I have to come on harder and more assertive than I normally would, or I'm going to be taken advantage of. Compromise. Okay, so we're this far apart on price, we'll split the difference. Now, is that a good thing to do? Yes, yes, when it's appropriate to do so. So it's not only knowing what these styles are, but knowing when they are appropriate. I don't like win-win. It's a fallacy. It says that you and I, Miranda, should win equally. There's a lot of times that's not going to happen. Politically, you have more clout. Oh, okay, but I'll try to work it so you'll get more value this time and I'll get more value later. So in a number of cases, and I taught for Michelin for years, it was not possible to have win-win. And then you have to negotiate with yourself and say, okay, it's, it's all right. I don't have the power. I need to give up more now in order to have that relationship so it'll work for me later. Okay. One of the best examples of this is the San Francisco International Airport. Now, I was smart enough that I was originally born in San Francisco. And about 18 years ago, we're bringing the family from Nova Scotia to San Francisco and they're flying there. What do the kids always say? Are we there yet? And so we get there, we have the luggage, and we're getting the rent a car from Avis. And this beautiful gold and black bus goes by from Hertz, and then another one from God knows who. And you think, oh my God, Avis must have gone out of business, and finally you get the Avis and you go to the car. So what happened is eight rent a car companies, fierce competitors, yes, decided to share the buses, and they built a vertical parking garage. And so the people got there faster. They saved over 300,000 million gallons of fuel. Pollution went down. Everybody, maybe except the bus drivers, won. So it was not adversarial. It was interspace. It was integrative, creative, mutual problem solving. One negotiation often leads to another. Now, there's eight floors. Who wants what? What do they really want? The first floor. The answer would absolutely be yes, unless you were really prepared. Because two years later, they got rid of the buses and they had the monorail. And the monorail stopped where? The eighth floor. All right. So, negotiation style trumps substance every time. So you need to identify your style and your partner style. I did not say opponent. I said partner. In Japan, you had a baseball player that had the most RBIs run batted in. Is that right? OK. I flunked baseball. All right. So he didn't look at the pitcher as his opponent. He looked at the pitcher as his partner because he wants the pitcher to pitch the perfect pitch so he can do what? Hit the perfect home run. Now, if I'm negotiating and Melanie, Melanie and I'm thinking she's my opponent, I'm not going to listen very carefully to her. I'm going to be thinking, okay, what can I do next? And because I'm doing that and I'm not listening well, I'm going to miss some of the keys to how to negotiate effectively. Negotiation is half talking, 50% talking, and 100% listening. Okay, so you're my partner, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so what is my style? And Francis Bacon said that a pertinent question is half wisdom. So the, the pertinent question is when does my style work for me and when does it what? work against me. All right, so here's a boat out in the Pacific Ocean, and the boat has a rudder, and there's a boat. And why am I talking about naval architecture? Well, look carefully at this slide. 
The rudder has a trim tab. That's a small rudder, which makes it easier to move the large rudder, which means there's more room in the boat because you don't need such engine or so much energy. Correct? All right. So the rudder, the trim tab, is analogous to your negotiating style. If you can control your style, you have more control over the negotiation. And if you can control the negotiation, you have more control over the outcome. So this is research by Gerald Williams. It's been replicated five times. And he did it with lawyers. And it turned out that, in general, 65% of the population are cooperative. The pertinent question is, that's not good enough. Because we have to say, are we an effective cooperative? And about 59% of the population were. So if we're cooperative, we want to move up that scale and become more effective. 3% were ineffective. And so if I'm negotiating with Don again, I can get all of the value... Thank you very much. Because, and you might want to write this down, your ineffective cooperatives tend to be gullible, naive, too trusting, and frequently taken advantage of. Now, just, just raise your hand if in your career you have never been too trusting and taken advantage of. Okay? That's true of all of us. We want to move up towards being effective. So I'll tell you about the effectives. The effectives come to the table incredibly well prepared. They can disagree without being disagreeable. And they're flexible so that they can change their style if, in fact, they need to. Now, let's look at our aggressives. 33% are ineffective. It's a harder style to use effectively. I'll give you the words for them. They're obnoxious. You're talking about on the phone, and 30 seconds later, you want to slam down the receiver. They are one-trick ponies. All they know how to do is be aggressive. And... If you call their bluff, you'll find out that they have come to the table ill-prepared. Our effective aggressives will, if they're dealing with a strong negotiator, either aggressive or effective, become cooperative because it's in their best interest to do so because getting a deal is better than what? Not getting a deal. Okay, so what are the characteristics of your effectives? And the 11% was no pattern. What was the characteristics of these three effectives? Well, number one, they come to the table incredibly well prepared. Number two, they're flexible. And number three, they have incredible self-control. If you've never, ever lost control in a negotiation, please raise your hand. I'm going to lose control when I find my daughter. <laughs> okay. So there's a situation and we react. That's important. So you put your watch on, you don't think about it. Well, those of you who still use watches. In other situations, you want to give yourself a choice. But what is really good is you want to give yourself a strategic choice. So we're going to talk about how to do that. I'm going to use a case study that is not MPI related to show you the power of the master negotiator's preparation form. So in your handout, you have the brief version of the form. So we're going to see a lot of it you do anyway. So this is a case study. 23 and a half years ago, we're shopping to get our Christmas portrait done. And we go to the biggest department store in Canada. And my wife is negotiating with my son to get winter boots. He wanted the Mutant Ninja Turtle boots that cost 10 times more than the ones that didn't have the Mutant 
deckle on them. My daughter Katie, eight months old, spies out of her little eye character slippers. So character slippers look like stuffed animals, and she was crazy about stuffed animals. And they were suspended from three feet down. As toddlers do, she tripped and fell into the display. To my horror, the displays were held up by pegboard hooks. Eight inches long, quarter of an inch round, and the end was up like this. And it caught her in the eye. Now, she's okay. She's perfectly fine. Well, except for not showing up. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Can you help me for a second? Sure. Yeah, can you come out here? Okay. I, want, I want to show you one of the ways that you can give yourself significantly more self control. Okay. So, you're Lynn. You're Cheryl. Lynn. You're Lynn. No, my I'm wife. Lynn. You're Lynn. Oh, okay. You're my wife. Okay. Congratulations. Oh. Okay. <laughs> or condolences. Okay. So I'm totally useless. I'm freaked out. Lynn happens to be a physician. And I don't believe in auras. But what I saw this woman do was get total control of herself from the top of her head down to every single toe. Total control. We went into the hospital with... Sorry. My daughter, Katie. Okay. And then you give Katie to the nurse. Okay. You're the nurse? Yes. Okay. Take this kid. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens to Lynn now? She loses control. Total lack of control. Right? But she put herself in the role of a doctor. So when we negotiate, what role do we put ourselves in? A strategic negotiator who doesn't have every single ounce of our career based on this negotiation, who has really good alternatives, or are we a victim? And if this doesn't work out, our lives will be ruined forever. Thank you. It's been nice to marry to you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I, I used to be a marriage counselor, and then I got divorced, so that was the end of that. Okay, so... In any negotiation, there's a choice point. A choice point. Oh, thanks. I'm a little mad at her right now. Okay, so there's a choice point. A choice point is an incredibly important point in the negotiation, whereby if you do the right thing in the right way at the right time, the negotiation will move forward towards an effective resolution. If you do the wrong thing in the wrong way at the wrong time, it will break off, stalemate, or escalate. Now, Daniel Goldman, the guy who wrote the uh, first one to write about emotional intelligence, said that awareness is the master aptitude. That's worth writing down. Awareness is the master aptitude. And so, as master negotiators, or working ourselves towards being master negotiators, we have to be aware that when we are at a choice point, that is a point of leverage where things are either going to go really good or really bad. Master negotiators ask high-yield questions. The master negotiator odors, <laughs> sorry, the master negotiator's mantra is you can't change somebody's mind if you do not know where their mind is. You have to be able to summarize their position and their interests more strongly and more succinctly than they are. You're going to want to use negotiation jujitsu, which we're going to see in just a minute. And we need to disarm the other party so that they can listen. And we want to set viable precedents. Okay, so let's, let's uh, take a look at the form. So the first thing on the form are your interests. Okay. Oh, where's the form? Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, so your interests. What are my interests? The acid test for an interest is not either or. 
it is so robust that if it's an interest, it will lead to multiple options. So if you negotiate a contract and you say, I want $40,000 for the contract, is that an interest? The answer is no. It's either yes or no. It is only concerned with money. We might be able to put some non-monetary things in and get an agreement that we couldn't have gotten otherwise. Just raise your hand if you've ever done that. If you, you, had, you put something else in that wasn't monetary and you were able to get to an agreement. All right. So... My first interest is that Katie will be all right. So I'm going to ask you to fill this out, because if you fill it out, you're 60 times more likely to remember it. So number one interest, Katie will be all right. Number two interests, this won't happen to anybody else. What's the store's number one interest? Okay, making money is important, and not losing money in a lawsuit. What else? Reputation. Now, which is more important, reputation or making money? Reputation. We live and die based on our reputation. They also don't want this type of accident to happen again. But they would prioritize their interests differently than I would. The prize is the ultimate outcome that you want from the negotiation, and it could be the interest or it could be different. So the prize for the store is not to maintain their reputation. It is a chance for the store to enhance their reputation. Just think of the Tylenol crisis. It's now the gold standard in how to deal with a crisis. They enhance their reputation. So it's not to maintain their reputation, it is to enhance it. So we have the interests, and now we have the prize. We're going to ask some high-yield questions, and I'll demonstrate that in just a minute. And then we want to look for creative options. Now, my, my prize was really the same as my interest. I don't want this to have anybody else, and I want Katie to be all right. Number one, Katie will be all right. Okay, can you help me, please? Can you come yes. up here? Sure. You are? Ken. Ken, okay, Ken. All right. So I filled out the form, and I'm negotiating with the store to change its display hooks. And I get a letter back saying, clearly we have kitty hazards. We're sending you two of our stuffed Christmas charity bears, and we'll look at this issue after the holidays. Is that okay? No. All right. So I want to negotiate to get them to change their mind. What do I have to do about their mind? I have to know their mind and their thinking more strongly and more succinctly than they do. So I talked with the president of the company. He was away. We played telephone tag. And they said, would I talk to the vice president, the guy that was going to send the two stuff, charity bears? And I said, yes, I would. But I wanted him to call me a half hour later at home. Nine minute walk from my office to my home. Why did I want to do it at home? Sorry, louder, somebody. Comfort zone, my territory, symbolic. Actually, the main reason I did it was I wanted to record the conversation so I could find out how well I negotiated about something I felt incredibly strongly about. That's called salient feedback. And in Canada, it's, it's legal. If only two people are there, you can record the conversation. In the United States, it's not, except I understand in Ohio. So if you want to record the conversation, go to Ohio. So I'm going to take you through the conversation. He said... What can we do? And I said, I would like you to remove those hooks from your store. He said, I'm not sure that's practical or possible. What do I say? It's possible. It is possible. So I got to escalate. You know, it's possible. You're dumb. What else? And it's practical. You're even dumber. 
Why not? Why not? Okay. You have to be careful of the word why, because the word why is often adversarial. When I see my daughter again, the first thing I'm going to say is, oh, there she is in the back. Where were you? <laughs> it, it ended at 4.30. Anyway, we'll get into that later. <laughs> I don't want to lose all my credibility. So he said, I'm not sure that's practical or possible. I'm going to ask a high-yield question without being adversarial. And I say to him, please help me understand how it isn't practical or possible. I'm going to shake hands. Okay. Everybody shake hands with somebody. You can't change somebody's mind if you don't know where their mind is. So help me understand how it's not practical or possible. I need to know how this guy thinks if I'm going to help change his thinking. And he said... We have more accidents on elevators and escalators. Now, if I lost self-control, I would say, what do you, sorry, what do you mean, nice shirt? What do you mean (laughs) you have more accidents on escalators and elevators? But I'm going to use negotiation jujitsu. So, (laughs) all right. I see where this is going. Okay, now... You're probably a couple years younger than I am. Okay, so I want you to come at me with a fist. And stop, stop. Okay, stop. Stop, (laughs) yes. One, sorry, one foot before impact. Okay. Okay, you know what a foot looks like? Yeah. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step aside, I'm going to take Ken's elbow in his hand, and I'm going to put the force in the direction that I want it to. So I said, help me understand how it's not practical or possible. He said we have more accidents on elevators and elevators, escalators. And so I say, how are you protecting children from accidents on escalators and elevators? He said, we put up signs. And I'm sorry, Lawrence, I've lost my mind. What else did they do? Oh, yes, thank you. (laughs) They put up signs. They have a committee looking into it. So I said, can you put up signs about these hooks and have the committee looking into it? For him to say no, whose logic is he refuting? His own. All right. So nothing happened. You can sit down. Okay, thank you. So... Now we come to the part on the form where what are some options? So what are some options I could present? Well, remove all of the hooks. Remove the hooks from three feet down. Because most of the accidents that happen are to children age one to four from three feet down. Or remove the hooks in the area where children are most likely to be to start with. So what are some options presupposing that they might say yes. Now, they didn't cooperate. So I need my BATNA. BATNA stands for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. If they don't agree, what am I going to do? So I could sue them, right? I could sue him. Okay, social media. I want to go back to suits. The suit. Okay. This is worth writing down. 90% of what we think is linguistically and culturally determined. 90% of what we think is culturally and linguistically determined. In Canada, you don't get very much for a lawsuit. I think we got $14,000. I've helped people negotiate those kind of accidents in the States, and they receive three or four million dollars. Different culture. It's too bad the accident didn't happen in the States. Okay. So, I can use social media. What else can I do? Actually, social media didn't exist at the time, but I can use media. Sorry? 
word of mouth. I had 24 mothers with children that were young that were protesting. I wasn't a hippie for nothing. (laughs) Now, I wrote to the person who was the board of directors of the store. Because under director's liability, if another accident happens, they are responsible. So that was my strongest batna. As a result, in five working days, no, seven working days, count them, seven working days, the store bent back the hooks to be safer until they could be replaced. How many hooks was it? I was flabbergasted. 10 million display hooks. So the store, which I really love now, is the Hudson's Bay Company. They took total responsibility and they changed 10 million display hooks. Not all of the organizations that I talked to were that responsive. So we want to set viable precedents. Sony, so then I contacted Sony. I'm not obsessive compulsive for nothing. And Sony got rid of their single prong hooks They destroyed them so nobody else could use them, and they made a $500 donation to the Canadian National Institute for the Blind in my name. Sony did something that was way above than I ever would have thought. I then started negotiating with The Gap right here in San Francisco. I think I had seven lawyers tied up for a week. And The Gap said that they would change their hooks in the children's gap. Now, the children's gap and the adult gap are right together. So I thought there was a gap in their thinking. (laughs) How did I convince them to change? I sent them the letter from Sony, because that had much more input. And bless them, they got rid of all of their hooks worldwide. So all of this was being an effective, cooperative negotiator. And I don't have a lot of patience. But with this issue, I don't care if it took me 100 years. So this is the power of the master negotiator's preparation form to make sure that you have all your bases covered. And this is a brief version. The longer version has more. So what about the yellow pages? What about the yellow pages? All right. You are... Uh, Melody. Melody, that's right. Excuse me? (laughs) This is my presentation. (laughs) All right? All right, well, that explains it. All right. (laughs) Okay. So, the yellow pages. I prepare as well as I can. And then I talk to Melanie from New Hampshire, and I show her the preparation form. She's going to come up with an option. She's going to come up with a better opening statement. She's going to come up with a concession that I might not have thought of in a million years. As a result, I'm going to come to the negotiation table more what? Confident. More prepared and more confident. How important is confidence in negotiation? Critical. All right. Now, I filled in the form. I'm feeling more confident. I've talked to Melanie in New Hampshire. Now I'm even more confident. If it's an important enough negotiation, you're going to role play it. Your name is? Anjuna. Anjuna. Beautiful name, Anjuna. All right. Now, you don't know it, but Anjuna, starting in January, is going to play the lead in Shakespeare's most romantic play, Romeo and Juliet. Now, is Anjuna going to show up there opening night and say, here I am? No, she's going to go to rehearsal after rehearsal after rehearsal because if Romeo here flubs a line, she can continue and nobody's going to notice. So what you're going to do is you are going to prepare for the negotiation from both parties' point of view because you want to know what your arguments sound like to the other party. Now, are you going to do this for every negotiation? No. But if it's important enough... You're going to fill in the form, you're going to use your yellow pages, and you're going to role play it. All right. Questions. I have a book for the first person who asks a question. 
It's an amazing book. I interviewed 32 of the best negotiators. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you, can you stand up so we can hear you? Yes. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So so let's assume that 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 we're having a negotiation, and you're in one department and I'm in another department. Mm -hmm. Departments are often at war with each other. So. We're just at loggerheads. So what do we do to break the impasse? Well, we're going to do something that's called a meta-negotiation. Meta is a Greek prefix that means about. So not only are we going to negotiate, we negotiate about how we're going to negotiate. And right now, you've been very adversarial. So... I could be adversarial. Who do you think you are? Your department is important. We're in sales. We make all the money. You're just in credit. You understand? Okay, now what's that going to do? It's going to cause me to be, you know, it's going to escalate. It's going to escalate. Exactly. So what I can say is, listen, for the betterment of the company, I would think that, that we should work this out. Because if we can't work it out, it's going to escalate. And it'll go to your boss, and it'll go to my boss, and then they're going to have to talk. I'm not sure if that's the best thing in the world that can happen to us. Why don't we take a break and think about it, and we'll meet again tomorrow. So it lets the tension go down, and we can come together thinking that what our BATNA is, right? It says BATNA. Well, underneath BATNA, it says WHATNA. So what's a WHATNA? the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. So the worst thing that can happen to us is both of our bosses think that we're incompetent. Okay? So it's a... And they would be totally wrong. But it's a meta-negotiation. So you negotiate, but you also negotiate about how you're going to negotiate. Katie, can you run up there and get a book, please? They're, they're back there somewhere. Okay. Uh, another question. I think I have another book. Yes. No, no, stand up so they can all hear you. Yes. Right. Okay. So I would ask them a behavioral question. It's called a behavioral interview. So I would say, tell me about the best negotiation that you did and how you did it. Tell me about the most difficult negotiation that you had and how you did it. And then the third one, tell me about a time that you failed as a negotiator and what you learned from it. So I'm going to be very careful to, to see if you really understand by asking those three questions. I'm also going to do my reference checks. And there's your picture on Facebook hitting somebody in the face. So that's, that's, it's not going to be you. K Katie, can we get another book? All right. So you want to be very, very careful. But not, it's not just about how we negotiate as individuals. How do we negotiate more effectively as teams? How do we in an organization negotiate more effectively across boundaries? One of the most creative solutions that I uh, heard about was a convention in Halifax, and it was going to go to the biggest hotel. What did, the, what did the smaller hotels do? They put in a joint bid. So they didn't cooperate. They didn't, they weren't, they didn't compete. They cooperated because it was in their best interest to do so. Now, the problem is that most people don't get enough feedback about how well they negotiate. So recording that interview 
was a test so I could listen to see how well I negotiated. The other thing is if you're going to be good at pattern analysis, you have to practice, 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 and practice. So I love going to small claims court. <laughs> I've learned a lot about negotiation. Most of what I've learned about negotiation is from Katie. <laughs> yes, sir. Katie, you want to get another book? Uh, can you stand up, sir? Right. And they're questioning what you're of course. That, you know, how do you, how do you... Okay. I'm a bookaholic. There's a book called Michael Useum. Michael Useum, U S E E M. It's not his best book, but it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's good enough. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you do if the person has more power? So I'm saying there's a book called. Yeah. That you have more knowledge, but they have more power. And so, actually, it's a better book than I thought. Because in the book, he tells, he tells nine stories of people who let the people under them lead the negotiation because they had more information. Right. right. And then there's others who don't. Correct. And, and, I mean, one of the worst was uh, climbing Mount Everest, where the top guy wouldn't listen to everybody else, and half of them died. Right. All right, so what you have to do is show them that it's in their best interest to use that kind of knowledge. Now, that's very subtle. Can you stand up, please? So I'm, I'm not going to say, listen, if we do this, we're probably going to do a lot better, and I want you to know how smart I am. I'm going to feed him some information so that he comes to the conclusion that we should use this. Or maybe I don't have any power to negotiate with him. But your administrator <coughs> assistant, Tammy, mm -hmm. she controls she, your schedule. Right. You work for her. You don't know it. But she's the person that can influence you the most. And so I have her as a strategic ally, and she will help me help you see what's going on. You, the person who's... Right. Wow. Or I build up such a good argument that it's almost impossible for him to say no. And he says, I don't, think, I, I don't really think I like this approach. And then you say... You're going to disarm him. You say, I'm not sure I like it either. But I found some information looking at what these three places did. And it seems that maybe in some cases it might be a better idea, but I'm not sure. So it's called perceived control. I put you in the position where you think you have control. Okay. Perceived control. Well, yes, but there are different ways to have perceived control. There's lots of ways to have perceived control. It, one, one of the things I found out in marriage counseling was often that the man thought he was in control and wasn't. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, yes. No, you have to stand up. Yes. Right. Okay. I want to recommend a book. It's called Difficult Conversations. Okay. Sorry? I'll repeat the question. Oh, Me. Yeah. Okay. So things have deteriorated to the point where nobody's listening to everybody else, anybody else, and it's gotten very personal. All right. Roger Fisher, who 
was one of the authors of the book Getting to Yes, would use something like meta negotiation. And he would say, listen, this has gotten out of hand and it's gotten personal. I'm sure at least half of it or more is my fault. Let's go back and start all over after we take a break. So that's one way. Or I apologize for coming on so strongly. Now, one of the things Roger Fisher does is that when he gets angry, he almost whispers. And then the person can hear the argument. They don't hear the anger. Now, there, there's another possible scenario. What, what's your name again, please? Dale. Dale. Okay, and th- this person is sitting next to you with the glasses? Eric. Eric. Okay, so these two have had a rip-roaring fight. And both of them feel badly. And you come in, and you want to be the peacemaker. And you know that they want to repair their relationship. But if Dale speaks first, and you don't respond positively, he's going to lose what? Face. Same thing. If he apologizes and says, listen, let's work this out, and you say, listen, you're dead to me. I never want to hear or from you again in my entire life. So we have a third party come in and say, listen, I know that you both have the best intentions in the world. My office is at free at 4 o'clock on Friday. I've got coffee and donuts. I think you can work it out. So it's, it's called a convener. All you did was make it easy for them to talk. Or you would make it even more difficult for them not to talk by saying, what's happening now is not in either of your best interests. It's the what now. It's becoming very public. And both of you are losing credibility. Or we, if you can't communicate... If you can't listen to each other, we bring in a third party to mediate. So there are various things that that can be done. And sometimes, I mean, one of the the, the things I heard that that I really like the most is if you guys don't work it out, you're both fired. (laughs) Yes? What if you were playing that facilitator role? What are some strategies to help the conversation keep moving? What if you are, you've got two different... Okay, did you hear the question? What, what if you're playing that facilitator role? What are some things that you could do to keep things moving? Next question. <laughs> okay. So, th- there's a book by Lauren Suskind. The guy's brilliant. It's called Breaking the Impasse. And what you do is you structure it. And first of all, you get them to make easier agreements that are most, more likely to be successful. Uh, I had a, a couple for marriage counseling, and they were deciding whether or not to have a baby, but they couldn't decide how to plan the weekend. So what you do is you get the people in, and you start not with the issue that's dividing them. You start with some ground rules. So... I I always start when I mediate with one ground rule, like no interruption. Okay, and are you okay with that? Okay, and are you okay with that? Okay, then it gets written down. And so they're being held accountable to the guidelines that they developed. And then I'm going to start with with one of you, and I'm going to say, do you have another guideline that you would like to see? Now, if they say a guideline, I don't want you to interrupt me ever again, I'm going to say no. It has to be positive. So what I'm hearing is that for you, a good guideline would be no interruptions. Now, I have to be neutral. If I say, listen, that's brilliant, 
That's textbook quality. The other party is going to feel that I'm not neutral. So I'm going to say that one of my jobs is to be as neutral as possible. If you find that I'm not being neutral, then it's in your best interest and mind for you to get somebody else. Now, by being that open, it's a model for them to be open. But before that gets written up, no interruptions, I'm going to make sure that the other party is comfortable. And then I'm going to start with the other party. And I'm going to have my eye contact equal between the two parties. Otherwise, they're going to think that I'm biased. I'm also going to tell them that mediation works about 80% of the time. And then I'm going to use a metaphor. If a picture is worth a thousand words, the right metaphor is worth a thousand pictures. And I'm going to talk about 1987, when, ba- I've got it, when baby Jessica fell down the well. Now, they had to get to her as quickly as possible to get her out alive. But if they went too quickly, it would cause a cave-in. So I'm going to let them know that this process of mediation is front-end loaded. And eventually, when you get them brainstorming, then you don't, you don't have to be a mediator anymore. You can be a facilitator. There's a very good video of this showing Roger Fisher, who t- ends up taking that role. And there's a negotiation within a negotiation, and it's at the PON, the Project on Negotiation from the Harvard Law School. And you can download it for $50. So when I teach mediation, I use that as a case study. Okay, we have, yes. Uh, Katie, do we have any more books left? No, okay. Are you, are you willing to do it for free? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so um, when negotiating with like a hotel, if they don't put in, the, like they agree to the negotiation and then don't actually put it in the contract, what do, how do you go back and forth with that without it escalating, like on my end, if I'm trying to... Right, it? but you've already lost. Right, but how do I get that back in there without... Because I'm not going to sign without seeing what it is that I want. Right. But so so what you, you, you're you preemptive and you say, listen, I really want to sign the contract. However. I need... No, you don't use however. <laughs> however is this disguised but. So what, after, what comes after the word but or however weighs seven times more and it's adversarial. Okay, so I would say, okay, so I need to do my due diligence just like you need to do your due due diligence. So I've disarmed. How can they disagree with that? You have to do your due diligence. So once you can sign off, let me look at it, and either I'll sign off or I might have to get a little bit of help. And you might want to get a little bit of help. So what they're, what they're using is they're using time against you to take advantage of you. So when the store did the same thing about changing the display hooks, their batna was to stall. They, went, they said, we're going to change them in the new year. Six months later, they didn't do anything. Okay, very good question. I, 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 time is up? I have 10 minutes. Okay, so... If, if you want a copy of the Master Negotiator's Preparation Form and the instructions on how to use it, you want to email Lawrence, the guy in the back, my business partner. Raise your hand. Lawrence is an engineer with an MBA who does nine... SO, what is it? ISO 9000 Consulting. So there's no detail he can't lose. There's, there's no detail that I can't misplace. So if you email Lawrence, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, at Brad McRae, B-R-A-D-M-C-R-A-E, dot com, he will send you a copy of the Master Negotiator's Preparation Form and the instructions on how to use it. If you want more information, then you can download for $5 Canadian, which is about 450 U.S. or less, um, the Master Negotiator's work, Workbook. And it has case studies, but it also has the three-party form, the four-party form, and the five-party form. Now, as soon as you add another person, the negotiation becomes much more complex. So the way you can think about it is if there are three people involved, 
then how many possible relationships are there? Because we can gang up on you. Or more likely, the two of you will gang up on me. So you, you take the number of people, three, and so it's n times n minus one. So three times two is what? Six. So you've got six possible relationships that you have to figure out. And so there's a three-party form, four-party form, five-party form, and there are examples. I should also say that what I didn't get to uh, is on the form you have, it has your opening statement. Now, your opening statement frames the entire negotiation. So when I wrote to the person that was a chair of the board, I said very, very carefully, my purpose isn't to be adversarial. I would rather work with the store so that it could what? Somebody just finish the sentence for me. Resolve. Resolve. Okay, somebody else? No, raise your hand. Resolve the problem. Okay, somebody else? Ah, enhance your reputation, it won't happen again. Those, that, that was the best one so far. What I had is so, so that your store could be a leader in protecting Canada's children. Any way they could disagree with that? Okay, so 90% 90, 90 of the way your negotiation ends depends on the way it begins. One of my favorite examples was at Michelin. So the salesperson from Michelin went to Atlanta and talked to the school board and said, if he would have said, I would like to sell you Michelin tires, then Kid Ken would have said, I would really love to have Michelin tires. I know they're safer than what we use, but we cannot afford it. So let me save you some time and me some time, and let's just end this conversation. Thank you very much for coming in. How'd the negotiation go? No. Because he used negotiation jujitsu. And he said, I agree with you. You cannot afford to buy them. Now, as soon as you get your first agreement, you want to get an agreement and keep building on those agreements. And he said, you're right. But, and here it's okay to use but, if there was a way that you could afford them, would you be interested? He has to say, yes. All right. So we've, we've looked very carefully. And no, you can't afford to buy them. But you can't afford to lease them from us. And we guarantee that they'll be operational 98% of the time or more, which is 20% more than what you're getting now. So that's going to save you a lot of money and a lot of headaches. The only thing is that we would like to have two of our people in your maintenance garage. Because the thing that wears out those kind of truck tires the most is they're not properly inflated. So they would then make to make, they would check to make sure that they're properly inflated. And this way, you can afford, because over the five years of usage, you can have our Michelin tires. Now, I know you can't start that today, but let's look at the ones that you can start with. And I want you to keep track of how well they work. And if they're not working 98% or more of the time, then you can have the tires. We're that confident that our tires are superior. So you want to make it easy for them to say yes, and you want to make it difficult for them to say no. Great question. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Now stand up so people can hear you. Um, your pattern analysis, how is that different than habits? Or, um... Oh, geez, I wish I had a book. Okay. I anticipated that question. All right. So let's take a little bit more carefully about what intuition and pattern analysis is. 
so this is a study. They took grandmasters and they took class B chess players. So there's grandmasters, class A, class B. And you'll notice, oh, my wife is leaving me again. Yes. Okay, uh, 11% 11, 11 of class B <laughs> made errors. But the grandmasters, it was 8%. Now, is that a significant difference? Yes. The reason is because it's true of play after play after play after play after play. So in a single case, no. But cumulatively, it is. So you, you go on holidays and the bathroom sink is dripping and you come back a month later. Each drip doesn't count for much. But you come back a month later, the bathroom is flooded. So it, it makes a huge difference over time. All right. Now, there's the 10,000-hour rule. So people who become experts in what they do, and it doesn't matter if it's chess or music or negotiation or sales, have put in 10,000 hours learning their craft. And then they're very, very good at pattern analysis. Because you're a grandmaster, you can play with 30 people all at once, and you can beat them all. However, if they give you a random pattern, you're no better than anybody else. So it's, it's the accumulation of that kind of wisdom. So it's a little bit different than a habit. Because I would be willing to bet that you have some bad habits. And if you knew my list of bad habits, they would never invite me back. <laughs> so it's not just a habit. It has to be an enlightened pattern analysis. Now we need to know when our ha they become habits. And we need to know when our habits work for us and when they work against us. So I'm very good at coming up with creative solutions. I'm not so good at getting emotionally hooked. When somebody violates my core value of fairness, I go berserk. And then I don't negotiate as well as I could or I should. All right. So what happened? They did it under blitz conditions. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Under blitz conditions, they had not two and a quarter, two minutes and a, two and a quarter minutes. They had six seconds to make their move. So under blitz conditions, the master, the grand masters were actually slightly better. Let's see what happened to the class B. Huge deterioration. So this means that the grand masters can recognize the pattern not only better, but also sooner. So if you want to be a grand master in negotiation, then you want to negotiate every single time you can. And one of the best places to learn how to do that is to work for a voluntary organization where you have no authority. Or coach uh, a little league. And the problem isn't the kids, it's their parents. So. Look for opportunities to negotiate. And then look for opportunities to take some of these principles and put them into practice. And I almost guarantee, if you'll fill out the Master Negotiator's Preparation Form three times and use it, and use your yellow pages, you will, in fact, be on your way to becoming a more masterful negotiator. Now I have to have a conversation with my daughter. Thank you very much. <laughs>